Welcome to the 75th Theoretical Physics Colloquium by Professor Cecilia Lunardini from Arizona State University. She received her PhD from CISA in Italy at International School of Advanced Studies in 2001. After that, she had two postdoctoral positions, uh, the first one at uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, and then the second one, uh, actually it was a research assistant professor at the University of Washington. She also held a five-year uh, fellow position at Institute for Nuclear Theory at the same time between 2004 and seven. She became a fellow of Brookhaven National Lab or Rican DNO Research Center to be more precise and uh, became a faculty at Arizona State University in 2007. And since 2018, she's a full professor. She uh, became a fellow of the American Physical Society in 2020. Uh, she's active in professional service. She serves as a member of uh, One Voice Advisory Board of Supernova Gravitational Wave Astronomy and Astrophysics and uh, the Nukfina Theory Network uh, Advisory Board. She has uh, wide research interests in neutrino physics, cosmological, astrophysical, solar neutrinos, diffuse supernova neutrinos, future neutrino factories, neutrino matter interactions, and other things. And today she will be talking about neutrinos and gravity, multi-messenger scenarios. And with that, I'll give the microphone to you, Sheila. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Igor, and thanks to all of you for joining me uh, today. So you see my title, Neutrinos and Gravity, Multi-Messenger Scenarios. Um, what I plan to do is to start with a brief introduction on possible interplays between neutrinos and gravitational waves in the next decades. And then I will uh, um, cover some scenarios that I find attractive for the future, which I have been working on recently. And then I will finish with discussions and uh, discussion and conclusions. So, um, you will see that these topics that I'm going to cover are very diverse and they involve neutrinos and gravity. So some of them are a little out of my comfort zone. Uh, I'm not a gravity person, so I apologize in advance for misreferences uh, mis and possibly inaccuracies that you may uh, find. So let's start with an introduction. And by now, probably all of you have heard this, uh, this key expression, multi-messenger astronomy. This is a, a blossoming field which uh, uh, is about observing the sky uh, using different messengers, neutrinos, photons, gravitational waves, and cosmic rays. And their interplay will uh, reveal a large amount of information that wouldn't be accessible if we only used uh, traditional astronomy. So uh, in my mind, the uh, birth of multi-messenger astronomy was in 1987 with the iconic detection of supernova 1987A uh, in, uh, in photons and neutrinos. So in this case, the discovery was done by astronomers uh, who uh, provided uh, an alert to the community, giving a time window, uh, an estimate of the position, distance, and mass of the star, and this alert reached the, uh, the currently operating neutrino detectors. Uh, and looking in archival data, it, uh, a neutrino burst from the supernova was discovered. These are 10 MeV or so neutrinos, which uh, um, confirm the basic uh, theory of cold collapse supernovae. So you see here the image of supernova 1987A and the, the uh, 20 or so neutrino data points that were detected from it. So fast forward 30 years, we come to 2017. Here the situation is, has evolved a lot. Um, now uh, uh, what, I'm, what I'm showing here is a discovery that was triggered by a neutrino detection. Now we have this kilometer cube detector at the South Pole called Ice Cube. It detects high energy neutrinos. And one of these neutrinos, so about 300 TeV energy, uh, was uh, considered promising. Um, it was considered to be most likely signal and not background. So an alert was disseminated. And the neutrino uh, provided localization and, of course, the timing information. And these, these information were used 
to do astronomy follow-ups. And as you can see here, listed several gamma ray uh, surveys found a counterpart of this neutrino. Uh, it's, it's this uh, uh, blazer called TX, TXS0506 uh, plus 056. And it's an active galaxy, and it was found to be in a flaring state. As you can see here, uh, you see here the gamma ray count go up just about at the time when the neutrino was uh, detected. So this flare would have been missed if it wasn't for the neutrino providing an alert of it. Now, 2017 was a magic year. It was also the year when there was this uh, famous detection of uh, a kilonova with the uh, following uh, uh, an alert in gravitational waves. So this was a, a discovery by LIGO Virgo. They found uh, um, a neutron star binary merger, provided an alert with localization and timing. And a gamma ray follow-up revealed a gamma ray burst from this merger and a kilonova. And the spectrum of the kilonova revealed uh, evidence of our process nucleosynthesis happening uh, in, in mergers, which, which was somewhat of a revolution um, that's, still, that's still amazing the community today. So in this figure, you see the, the sky map with the localization provided by gravitational wave and gamma rays together, and the, uh, the green are the gamma rays, gamma ray count, and the blue plot is the gravitational waveform. Uh, so what's still missing in the picture is a joint detection of neutrinos and gravitational waves. There have been various claims of coincidence, co coincidence of neutrinos, photons, cosmic rays, but no robust claim of neutrino gravitational wave association. So that's what I thought I would focus my talk on. And to begin with, let me uh, give a brief overview of the future of gravitational wave detectors. So this, this graph shows the situation very well. This part here on the right is the present. We have LIGO, Virgo, CAGRA. These are ground-based interferometers. And their frequency of sensitivity is uh, um, in the hundreds of hertz or, or lower. But for sure above a hertz. And so in this regime, what, what signals can we expect? We expect signals from core collapse supernovae, rotating neutron stars, uh, stellar mass, uh, compact binaries merging. Um, the future lies in, uh, of course, improving LIGO, there will be improvements, but ultimately in order to go to lower frequencies in the subhertz regime, we will need a new class of detectors, which would be space-based like LISA, that's probably the best known ones. And also uh, we could use pulsar timing arrays. So these techniques will allow us to explore the subhertz region where other signals are expected. These are, these are processes that have longer time scales and therefore they translate in lower frequency. And uh, so, for example, they could be um, uh, compact objects captured by supermassive black holes or binary supermassive black holes uh, mergers. So neutrino observatories have a lot of room to grow, and there is a lot to look forward to. So in the immediate, in the next maybe five to 10 years, there will be um, new de detectors at the 10 kiloton mass scale, which will be, uh, will still use traditional techniques to some extent, but they will uh, be cleaner in terms of background. And then there is the advent of liquid argon detectors, that's the Dune project, which is complementary to current scintillator and water detectors. But in my view, the turning point really will be when we reach the kiloton mass. So that's the first to come is the Hyperkamiokande <laughs> project. The Hyperkamiokande hyper will reach a mass, fiducial mass of a quarter of a kiloton, uh, which makes it the size of the Notre Dame Cathedral. That's very, very impressive. 
Um, but I'm confident that hyperkamia grande will be a first. So yeah. ultimately, we will reach megaton mass, and that would be a revolution. There is, also, there is also room for growth for kilometer cube detectors like ice cube, which will improve. There is ice cube gen two coming up and uh, as other detectors of the same kind will join the uh, multi-messenger community. So these detectors will be uh, cleaner and more sensitive um, to faint signals coming from far away astrophysical objects. So let me start with, after this brief introduction, let me start with my first uh, attractive scenario for the future, uh, which is core collapse supernovae. So as I mentioned, core collapse supernovae are already detectable uh, by uh, LIGO, Virgo, and CAGRA because their frequency is in the hundreds of hertz. So let me start with a mini review on what the core collapse supernova is. Um, it's the way uh, massive stars end uh, their lives. Uh, stars above eight or 10 solar masses or so uh, evolve and they, they uh, become eventually super giants. And they go through um, the entire cycle of nuclear fusion, producing heavier and heavier elements, developing this sort of onion structure where ultimately iron starts to form in the core. And iron is the most tightly bound nucleus. It cannot be fused anymore. And so when an iron core starts to form, uh, the pressure provided by, fu by fusion um, uh, turns off. And that ultimately causes this, the core to become unstable and collapse um, under its own weight, basically. So the collapsed core, which is now called a, proto a protoneutron star, is very dense and very stiff in terms of equation of state. So it's, it's practically incompressible. And so matter that falls on it will bou bounces off it and creates a shock wave. Um, the shock wave is, is ultimately responsible for the explosion of the star, which is what is called a supernova when the star explodes. Now, neutrinos are emitted immediately after the collapse, uh, and they cool the newly formed proton-neutron star. They are emitted thermally with average energies between, say, 10 and 18 MeV, uh, and they, they are emitted from a, from a sphere. It's like a fermionic black body of radius of about 100 kilometers, and they carry away uh, 3, 10 to the 53 ergs over about a, tens, a burst of a tenth of seconds. So the uh, luminosity um, of this neutrino burst is, is interesting because it carries a narrative of the physics that takes place at different times. So you see here, there is a ramp up, there is a peak, which is due to electron capture producing electron neutrinos. And then the first fraction of a second is the, uh, what's called the accretion phase. This is when uh, the neutrino emission is dominated by the energy brought in by the mass, which is accreting on the core. And this is when the shock wave is stalled uh, inside the star. After this time, the shock wave is re-energized by neutrinos depositing energy into it. And after the shock is launched, then the neutrino emission continues, and this is the cooling phase. This is just the proton neutron star cooling by neutrino emission. And you see here, uh, there is a turn off when we transition from surface emission to volume emission after a few tens of seconds. So uh, there, is a, uh, there are set many predictions uh, of gravitational waves from core a core collapse supernova. The um, frequency is in the range of hundreds of hertz. You see here an example of how the waveform would look like. And this is definitely observable at LIGO if we had a galactic supernova. Um, the plot at the bottom is, uh, is an intensity plot with frequency on the vertical and time on the horizontal. And you see in colors where most of the energy is. And there are two regions indicated with A and B. Uh, A is the so-called G mode, which I have to admit is, is not something I, I'm an expert of, but my understanding is that it's like, uh, it, it, these are mo this is a mode due to the proton neutron star being hit and vibrating like a bell. And then the, uh, this other region, which is indicated with the letter B, is uh, uh, due to the so called SASI, 
which means standing accretion shock instability. This is a this is a large scale sloshing motion of the shock front, um, which uh, uh, where where there is this sort of uh, like you can imagine a mass like a sloshing around, and this also produces gravitation waves at about hundred hertz of frequency. So this is where uh, the first opportunity for an interplay with neutrinos is in this Sassi phenomenon. Um, so you can see here in this figure, the gravitational waveform, which is the, the blue curve. And you see that there are these ripples here in the second half of the plot. And the red curve up here is the um, count, the neutrino count as a function of time in time bins. And it also has the same uh, oscillatory behavior. Mm, so this is, this is very interesting. And you see that because the neutrinos are also influenced by this sloshing motion of the stalled shock, uh, certain areas are heated more than others. And so there is this, there is this from the point of view of the observer, there is this sort of uh, oscillatory behavior of the luminosity. And if you look carefully, there is a little bit of a phase shift between the two curves, which these authors analyzed, and they, they claim is physical, is due to the difference in the radii uh, between the radius of the proton-neutron star and the radius of the neutrino sphere. So this is something that I'm interested in, and I, I have work in progress on this, uh, which hopefully I will be able to talk about uh, another time. Um, but now I want to move on. And before I do, I just want to clarify that, uh, of course, this is a very vast subject and I should have cited probably hundreds of papers uh, on, on all the things that I mentioned. So instead of doing that, I, I listed several reviews that in my opinion are comprehensive and cover both neutrinos and gravitational waves from Corcola supernovae. So, uh, let me now uh, go into more detail and uh, uh, illustrate a different type of gravitational wave that we, we expect to see from a core collapse supernova. And that's called the gravitational memory of supernova neutrinos. So the gravitational memory is a well-known phenomenon. It's a, it's a, it's a waveform which uh, um, starts at zero and then uh, asymptotes to a non-zero value of the gravitational strain. So it's a permanent distortion of the local space-time metric. The wave comes, distorts the space, and the distortion remains in principle forever. Um, and this, is, this phenomenon happens when we have uh, uh, an unbound uh, system, uh, for example, uh, an object which is emitting matter or energy in, uh, in an anisotropic way. So this is the case for neutrinos from a supernova. And uh, in particular for this case of supernova neutrinos, um, the formalism has been developed and the formula for the strain is written here. Uh, you see it goes like the inverse of the distance to the star and it's the in integral over time um, of the neutrino luminosity multiplied by this quantity alpha, which is called the anisotropy parameter. Because this, is, this, is, uh, this, this memory is non-zero only if there is a certain amount of anisotropy. And because the supernova neutrinos are emitted over tens of seconds, we are looking at a signal in the subhertz scale, which is uh, ideal for the next generation of subhertz uh, detectors. So uh, let, let me go into more details about the anisotropy, which is key for this phenomenon. Um, numerical simulations show that the neutrino luminosity uh, is slightly anisotropic. So this D in L nu D omega is the uh, luminosity differential in solid angle, and this is this is um, this is non-zero. And this parameter alpha of t is a dimensionless quantity that expresses this anisotropy. This psi is a combination of uh, um, trigonometric functions related to the, uh, the, uh, the position of the observer. So it's, it's not that important. Uh, these are, uh, these are, this is a numerical uh, result from these, uh, these authors 
showing alpha as a function of T. And they find that alpha develops during, the anisotropy develops during the accretion phase in the first half a second after the collapse. And it has this uh, complicated shape and it's of the order of maybe 1% or so. And these are, these are two dimensional simulations. So again, um, there is a lot of literature on the memory. There are theoretical papers starting in the 70s and then more recently up to, up to last year, there are numerical simulations showing results for uh, the memory. So um, I thought that this memory phenomenon is, uh, is an interesting target for uh, the next generation of detectors. And so I decided to, uh, to study this. And so with my student, Moinak Mukopadiai and postdoc Carlos Cardona, we produced a paper earlier this year where we build a phenomenological model for the memory. So uh, the idea of behind having a phenomenological model is that this is a model you can play with. You can uh, explore different possibilities. Uh, it can be used for uh, planning future experiments and so on. So it's, it's, it's a tool that can be used in many ways. Uh, and, because, uh, and because it's analytical, then it can be, um, uh, it, it, it's very easy to use as opposed to a complicated and time consuming numerical code. So to build this phenological model, we uh, took uh, some analytic expressions for the two main ingredients. One of them is the neutrino luminosity, which is modeled as a declining exponential over time. And then alpha of T, the anisotropy, is modeled as a constant uh, plus uh, several Gaussians. And if you plug these two expressions in the master formula that you have seen in the previous slide, you get an analytical expression for the strain, which is written here. It's not pretty, but it's uh, uh, nevertheless um, uh, useful. And then we also have an analytical expression for the Fourier transform of the strain. So this is a function of the frequency. And uh, I don't expect you to read this in detail. Just, just consider that we have this analytical form that we can use. And the first thing we did was to check if our uh, toy forms for uh, L nu and alpha are reasonable, and they are. They match reasonably well uh, the results of numerical simulations. And keep in mind that we are not interested in reproducing this, the fast fluctuations that you see in the red curve, because those would would influence the signal at high frequency. So we are more interested in the low frequency part and therefore the overall shape of these curves. Julia? Yes. Quick question about this. Um, so if I understood it right, the anisotropy is the result of this uh, second mode, uh, SASI or something you called it. Yes. Is that correct? And if that's correct, why there are negative and positive values of anisotropy? Shouldn't it be one sign? Uh, yeah, well, okay, so let, let me go in order. So first of all, yes, so the anisotropy is the result of both convection in general and this large scale mode, which is called SASI, where you have a more large scale motion of the, of the shock front. The reason, uh, the reason you have the, the sign being both positive and negative is because um, it's, it depends on the orientation of the uh, of the observer. So this these quantities here, this psi is a bunch of sines and cosines, and it can be uh, it, it can be uh, positive or negative. So it's I, I know it's counterintuitive, but um, it just means that the strain you can have the strain go okay, that can go in both ways. Um, okay. So. Yeah, so this, so this quantity, you, you can, if you look at this formula, these are sines and cosines which depend on the orientation. And so you can have a negative, uh, you can have a negative uh, anisotropy because of that. Okay. So quick, quick question here. In yeah. red is data and uh, uh, blue yes. here is toy model, right? Yes. Well, okay. that is not data, is it? 
It's a numerical, it numerical data, numerical, numerical simulation okay. data, yes. It's not okay. the observed data. No, no, nothing is observed here. It's all simulated. Okay, so if that was the question, I guess I can continue on. Um, so this is, this is a, again, a comparison with numerical results. Uh, the red curve is numerical from this uh, paper uh, cited at the bottom. And uh, the other lines are our uh, result for H of T. Um, and one of the curves, the dashed line, is obtained by uh, taking these two dashed lines and plugging them in the, in the master formula. And the dash dotted line is obtained by uh, doing a phenological fit of the analytical H of T to the numerical curve. So this is to show that um, the agreement is, is reasonable. And so this can be used, this toy model can be used to do for a number of applications. So one application that we did was to develop several case studies. I'm not spending out of time on this, but let me just say that we modeled two cases. The, the curves with the A um, indicate models where the anisotropy is zero, is, is non-zero only in the accretion phase and, and is zero in the cooling phase. So these models have a sharp price and then uh, uh, after that, there is a plateau. And then models with the W are models where the, the anisotropy is always non-zero. So they, uh, uh, the strain develops over a longer time scale of several seconds. So uh, the most interesting figure is this one, in my opinion, where I'm showing this uh, quantity HC, which is called characteristic strain. It's a dimensionless quantity. It's obtained by uh, taking the modulus of the Fourier transform of the strain multiplied by twice the frequency. And you see here the results uh, uh, as a function of frequency um, for our models. And we, these are compared with the sensitivity curves, curve of the SIGO, which is one of the largest planned uh, deci, decihertz uh, detectors. So uh, everything above the, the SIGO curve is detectable. So this is for a gal typical galactic supernova at 10 kiloparsec distance. And you see that even for the most conservative model, uh, this signal should be detectable. And all the models fit this, this upper bound, which is derived by simply uh, uh, maximizing all the input quantities. So the message is that this is an attractive signal for upcoming uh, decihertz detectors. And this plot shows that in more details. This is one of our models, is the, one of the most conservative ones. The signal is shown in blue as, uh, um, as a function uh, for, for several distances, okay? And, um, and then we have sensitivity curves of several detectors. I just want to point out that some detectors are atomic interferometers like this one, MAGIS. And then the big, big players here will be the SIGO, BBO. And uh, the SIGO can be improved technically the, the, from the purely technical point of view, the SIGO can be improved by three orders of magnitude to reach ultimate the SIGO. And for ultimate the SIGO, our signal will be detectable for uh, more than 10 megaparsec distance, which is more than what Hyper-K can possibly do. So it's a way to detect neutrinos gravitationally, even in the absence of an actual neutrino detection at, at a neutrino detector. So, uh, Inspired by this last uh, idea of how the memory can reveal the presence of a neutrino burst uh, at high distances, uh, then uh, uh, we started a new project with my student, uh, Moina Kumukopadiai, and my former postdoc, Zidu, Zidu Lin. Um, the idea is to study how uh, the memory signals can be used as time triggers to um, detect neutrinos from very far away supernovae. So the key here is the time coincidence with the memory. Every time uh, you have a memory signal detected, you take a time, 10 seconds time window coincident with that, and you only look in that time window. Uh, and if you do this type of search for say three decades, uh, then uh, background will be very low 
and you can have a practical linear background free sample of supernova neutrinos from supernovae in the local universe up to a distance of uh, maybe 100 megaparsecs or so. So what we find is that uh, in order to do this exercise and have uh, a sufficient number of triggers, we need a detector 10 times better than the SIGO, 10 times in terms of noise. And uh, if we do, if we have that, we can get, we can have after a few decades, we can have a sample of neutrinos from supernovae in the local universe. Then this is new compared to either having a uh, the galactic supernova, which is just one, or having the diffuse flux uh, of supernovae or supernova neutrinos from the entire universe, which is dominated by cosmological supernovae. So this, this local universe sample is a new possibility that will be open by memory detections. And these are our preliminary results. Uh, this shows the number of neutrinos obtained, neutrino events obtained with this technique um, from time triggers within a certain distance d. So for each uh, distance on the horizontal axis, these are the neutrinos that you get from supernovae up to that distance. And it depends on how well we can do with the time trigger. So this DeSigo plus that you can see here is this DeSigo times improved by an order of magnitude. And we expect with that triggers up to maybe 30 or so megaparsecs and uh, I had, uh, a few tens of neutrinos, maybe 10 to 30 or 40 neutrinos. But if we have ultimate DeSigo, we have time triggers all the way to hundreds of, mega, uh, of megaparsecs, and we have hundreds of neutrinos obtained that way. The plot on the left is a more conservative scenario, and the plot on the right is a slightly more optimistic scenario where we put in the mix the possibility that we could have a, we could have failed supernovae where SAS is particularly strong and therefore the anisotropy is larger and so we can have uh, triggers up to larger distances. And in this case, even this IGO can do something. So even this IGO can see can give us triggers up to maybe 20 or 30 megaparsecs. So now I come to the second scenario that I want to uh, talk about, which is uh, binary mergers. Uh, binary mergers are the most common signal detected at LIGO. We have so many of them, um, but you will see that neutri detecting neutrinos from them is, is not so easy. So metal-rich mergers are neutrino sources. So you can see here in this cartoon, uh, if we have two neutron stars or a pair of neutron star and a black hole, the two will merge. And in the post-merger phase, we have enough matter to produce an accretion disk, ejecta, and possibly a gamma ray burst. And what I want to focus here is the accretion disk and the compact object, which, which could be, uh, in the case of a binary neutron star, it could be a hypermassive neutron star or a black hole. And in the case of black hole neutron star, it has to be a black hole. So this, uh, the idea of uh, uh, detecting uh, and studying thermal neutrinos emitted from the compact object and the accretion disk is not new. It has been studied by many authors. There are many numerical simulations uh, uh, giving us the flux and spectra of these neutrinos and phenomenological studies about uh, possibly detecting them. And one of these phenomenological studies is our own. Um, so this is a study um, that I uh, did, I'm trying to find the citation here. It's a study that I did with my former postdoc, Zidulin. We looked at uh, uh, different numerical models uh, for the neutrino emission in the post-merger phase. And you can see them detailed in this table. Um, I don't expect you to read this table, but just, just quickly, uh, average energies are similar to supernova neutrinos, maybe slightly higher. Um, the duration is typically shorter, maybe a second or even less than a second. And uh, the total energy emitted in a single neutrino flavor is a few 10 to the 51 ergs, which is roughly a 
10% of a supernova. So this is a weaker, similar in terms of physics, but weaker than a core collapse supernova. And uh, uh, by examining these models, we found that you have more neutrinos if the accretion disk is larger, intuitively speaking, that makes sense. And if we have a more massive and long-lived hypermassive neutron star. Um, another element to consider is that mergers are less frequent than supernovae. Um, the merger, merger rate as a function of redshift is plotted here. It's uh, uh, at least 10 to the minus two, the core collapse rate or less. So there is about an order of magnitude uncertainty. Uh, you see here the, the span of, the, of these different uh, models. So considering the lower energy and the lower rate, we expect a really low flux of neutrinos compared to supernovae. But still using uh, LIGO or another gravitational wave detector as a time trigger, we can hope to detect maybe a handful of these neutrinos in a decades of operation if we have a megaton mass detector. So similar to the previous idea that I have shown for supernovae, here the idea is to use this, these time triggers, cut a narrow one second time window and get rid of the background that way and uh, uh, these curves show are similar to the previous plot. So the distance now is in redshift. So we go, we go up to cosmological distances here. And on the vertical is the number of neutrinos per 100 years per megaton. And the various curves correspond to different models for uh, the post-merger neutrino emission. And we found that the numbers vary a lot. So we can have maybe 10 neutrinos in the most uh, optimistic case and practically none in the most pessimistic case and, and everything in between. Uh, so there is, there is the chance that we could detect some of these neutrinos. And uh, this, this line here, uh, slanted line, is the, is the background rate. So if we co continue to use triggers up to very high redshift, then we are only increasing the background, but we are not really increasing the signal much. So we can go up to maybe a redshift of 0 0.2, which is remarkable. It's, it's a cosmological uh, distance. So this may seem discouraging, but I, uh, these authors, and also in our paper we discussed that, um, make the point that uh, even one detection can tell us a lot. So suppose you run your detector and you um, wait for, I don't know, 35 years. And after 35 years, you see one neutrino, which is established to be from a merger. This will discriminate between models because different models predict a different uh, probability distribution for the waiting time. So if you wait a long time and you don't see anything, you can exclude the most optimistic model, which predicts a shorter waiting time. So even running the detector for say two or three decades uh, will, will give information. Okay, so now I'm ready to transition to my last topic, which is tidal disruption events. So tidal disruption events have appeared in my slide before under a different name, compact object captured by a supermassive black hole. So let's go into that. Uh, a tidal disruption event is uh, basically a very asymmetric merger uh, between a star and a supermassive black hole. So imagine a star like the sun approaching a black hole of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 7 solar masses, um, this star can be swallowed whole or it can be disrupted before it's, it's actually swallowed. And this disruption is what I'm, most, I'm mostly interested in. Um, the star is, this, is shredded into pieces by the tidal forces. The black hole is less than a few 10 to the 7 solar masses. And if the star approaches the black hole and gets to a distance which is less than the so-called tidal radius, which is, which is this radius plotted here, the formula is really tiny here. You can see it maybe. Um, physically, this tidal radius is where is the point where the tidal forces of the black hole start to overcome the self-gravity of the star, and so the star breaks apart. 
So as a result of that, we have, a, we have this fan of debris coming out of the black hole. Some of them are ejected into outer space, and some of them remain bound to the black hole and uh, will form uh, an accretion disk. So either disruption events are gravitation wave sources, just like any binary merger would be, but they have not been detecting gravitational waves. And that's mostly because um, they, are, they, they are localized at very low frequency. So they are a good target for LISA, for example. If you look at the predicted waveform, so this is, this is a result of some numerical calculation, I believe. Um, you see here the time scale is hundreds of seconds. So we are really deep into the subhertz regime here. And uh, this, this paper gives several of these waveforms. And if uh, by looking at them, my impression is that the amplitude and the average frequency of the waveform increase with the penetration factor beta. So basically the closer the star approaches the black hole, um, the, uh, the higher the amplitude of the waveform and, and the frequency as well. So um, my research so far has been on uh, photons and neutrinos from tidal disruption events. So this, is, this cartoon illustrates very well the post-merger, uh, so to speak, phase when the star's debris have settled in an accretion disk. Um, and this accretion disk cools by uh, emitting optical UV and X-ray photons. So these are, these are thermal, uh, thermal emissions. And then there are two other elements that are important. One of them is the outflow. So we have gas, which is in, uh, kind of emitted out at subrelativistic velocity. And this is, this is detected mostly at radio frequencies. It produces radio photons. And then um, the most extreme tidal disruption events could have a relativistic jet. So there could be a jet, hadronic jet, uh, spitting out uh, shells of matter. Um, and if you're wondering about neutrinos, neutrinos could come from the jet, which is the scenario I have studied, but they could also be emitted in the outflow and also directly uh, from the accretion disk. So before I, I move any further, I just want to emphasize again that tidal disruption events uh, are very long transients. So they are observed, uh, they are observed in the optical UV and X-rays, and they last for a very long time. The key quantity here is the so-called Eddington luminosity, uh, which is of the order of 10 to the 44 Earths per second for a 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole, is proportional to the black hole mass. And uh, the flare, which is caused by this emission of thermal and jetted emission, um, the, the flare lasts only as long as the accretion, mass accretion rate uh, exceeds the additive luminosity. So the moment it drops down uh, the, below the additive luminosity, the flare should, should quickly disappear. And uh, uh, it has been known for since the 80s that this duration, this corresponds to a duration of months or even years. So these are these are objects that are stay around for a long time. And by the way, they are a way to illuminate black holes that are normally quiet. It's like having an AGN that lasts for a year and then disappears. So black holes that are normally quiet become active for for uh, that that duration of time. So this is the most. This plot shows. Most famous tidal disruption event is called SWIFT J1644 uh, plus 57. Uh, and it's famous for two reasons, because it was detected at several wavelengths, very detailed observation, very clean. But it's also famous because it's only one out of three uh, uh, TDEs that were established to have a jet. So this, this was a jet TD, and the jet was identified by um, the observation of a hard X-ray spectrum, where hard means non-thermal. Non most, most TDEs, there are ha about 100 of them, most of them are purely thermal. So again, lots of references starting in the 70s about the physics of this phenomenon. Uh, numerical simulations, observations, predictions for gravitational waves, 
and predictions for cosmic rays and neutrinos from tidal disruption events. So the work I did recently um, is, has, has to do with uh, neutrinos possibly coming from a tidal disruption event with a jet. So the idea is that neutrinos could come from the jet and the way they are produced is pretty much similar to any other astrophysical jazz. It could be like a gamma ray burst or an AGN. The physics is pretty much the same. So we have the central emitter, which uh, spits out uh, shells of plasma at, at relativistic speed. Um, each shell has a slightly different speed. So ultimately the shells collide. And in this collision, after the two shells have merged, in this collision region, uh, the Fermi acceleration mechanism can take place and we can have protons accelerated to very high energies up to maybe PeV or so. And uh, then these protons will collide with background photons or background protons and produce pions and then neutrinos are produced. For each pion, we have three neutrinos produced from the pion decay chain. So for a, a, a given parent proton, the neutrinos will take up a fraction, maybe a percent or so fraction of the energy of the parent proton. Now this science predicting, predicting the spectrum of neutrinos from a jet is, is very numerical, but I, I just wanted to give an idea of how it works. And so this is some uh, analytics, which is rough uh, because it's obtained in the so-called delta resonance approximation. Uh, where the cross the proton photon cross section is approximated as purely purely with the delta resonance so a resonance uh, a cross section and uh, uh, in that case it's possible to calculate predict the neutrino fluence analytically the fluence is the flux times the square of the energy and these are the main ingredients so there is a normalization basically how much energy goes into the protons and then the key quantity is this FP gamma, which is the pion production efficiency. So that depends on how much energy you have in your background photons. You need to have enough background photons to have efficient pion production. And then, and then it depends on the size of the collision region. So basically, the more compact the collision region is, the more efficient the neutrino production is. And that's reflected by these two parameters here. Gamma is the Lorentz factor of the shells. And there is a dependency on gamma to the minus four. And this TV is the variability time scale is basically the average time between two shells being emitted. And it goes like this variability time scale to the minus one. And also the energy of the photon is important. So I don't want to go into the details, but let me just say that the spectrum of neutrinos uh, if there was no, if there were no energy losses, the spectrum of neutrinos would pretty much follow the spectrum of the parent proton, which typically goes like energy to the minus two. But because of, of the energy losses, there are, the, there are these correction factors, zeta pi and zeta mu, which reflect the fact that beyond a certain energy, there, is a, there are cutoffs uh, due to the pions and muons losing energy before, before they decay. So, so um, here is, here is something that gives a graphical idea of what to expect. So this is again, the fluence E squared times the, times the spectrum. And uh, these are two models, the purple one and the dashed line are two different models by Walter Winter and myself. Um, and you see that the energy, the, the, the peak is between a fraction of a PV and a few PVs. And then at higher energies, these, these uh, energy losses kick in. And so we have, we have this turn off. And the plot also shows that uh, the predicted diffuse flux from all tidal disruption events is within the uh, limits uh, imposed by the current ice cube uh, data. So tidal disruption events could contribute up to maybe a quarter of the total flux that ice cube is uh, observing. So the last thing that I want to mention, I, I'm running a little late, but this is going to be quick is an exciting observation of a neutrino in coincidence with a tidal disruption event. The tidal disruption event was discovered in a follow-up search um, following this uh, ice cube neutrino event in, 19, uh, in, in 2019. This was a 200 TV energy 
And the tidal disruption event identified as a counterpart is called AT 2019 DSG or Brand Stark. That's how they call it inside the ISQ collaboration. It was discovered by ZTF, which is an optical UV survey. And the p-value of random association is low, is less than 0.5%, which means this is about a three sigma significance. So in this figure, you see the light curve. The top is the light curve at various optical UV uh, wavelengths. And the bottom is the light curve in X-rays. And you see that the X-ray curve uh, died out pretty quickly. So the X-rays became unobservable a few tens of days after the peak. And, uh, uh, and the, dash, the dotted line, dotted vertical line, is the time when the neutrino was detected. So it's kind of curious that it's, uh, there is 150 days, we're talking about five months, between the peak of the TDE and the neutrino arrival. So I'm making a very long story short by showing our model. This is Walter Winter and myself. This paper is now published I, in Nature Astronomy. I didn't have time to update the reference. Uh, and this is called a concordance jetted model. Concordance because it, it's, it's kind of comprehensive. It, it explains the neutrino observation as well as the photon observations using this sort of scenario. So you see here the black hole, the accretion disk emitting X-rays and optical UV photons. Here is the jet. So we assume there is a jet and this is where the shells collide. And uh, um, the idea is that not much happens at early times, say in the first 20 days or so, because the key here is the flow. This bluish object is the outflow. So the outflow here is transparent to X-rays, but later on, after say 20 days or so, the outflow has built up and it becomes, it's starting to become opaque to X-rays. So, so some of the X-rays would be backscattered into the jet and provide the ideal target for uh, neutrino production. So this slide says exactly what I just said before. Uh, let me just emphasize that in this model, we, are, we have a direct link between the X-ray luminosity of the TDE and neutrino emission. And this idea was inspired by the fact that the X-ray luminosity they drop so fast. So it's kind of suggestive of an absorption effect uh, at play. And the other thing that I don't have much time to say, but it's interesting, is that uh, um, the data from ZTF match something which is called the unified TDE model um, by these authors, which predicts how the values observable scale with the black hole mass. So everything matches if we assume a black hole mass of 10 to the six uh, solar masses. So using this mass, we use this unified TDE model to set the scale for the jet, because that's a prediction of the unified model. And so here it is, we have, these are our inputs. So we have X-ray, an X-ray luminosity as an input. We have the jet uh, luminosity as input. And we, as, we assume that 10% of the X-rays are isotropized and end up into the uh, jet. So these are all, I could spend 15 minutes explaining these curves, but let me just say that they are all motivated either by a unified model that I mentioned before, or by slim disk simulation for X-ray emission, or by the data themselves. So here is the, our results. This is uh, these are obtained using the new Cosma code, which is was developed by Walter Winter and collaborators. And the result is the red curve. This is the neutrino luminosity, and you see here that it's sustained over five months. So it has actually a, a kind of slightly a double peak. And the reason we have, and, and one of the peaks is where the neutrino was detected, the arrow here. So the reason there is a double peak is, is twofold. First of all, we have this tens of days time scale for the uh, X-rays to start being backscattered into the jet. And the other contributing factor is that the data support the idea that the system shrinks over time because it cools. And so we uh, implemented that by impl implementing a slight shrinkage of the collision region, which I mentioned earlier, makes the neutrino production more, um, more efficient. 
So this is another result. This is the uh, predicted fluence for the neutrinos, total solid curve, and the two non-solid curves are the first 100 days and the second 100 days. And this is where the neutrino energy uh, is, the detecting neutrino energy is, so there is good consistency. And this model predicts between 0 0.05 and 0 0.25 neutrinos detected at ice cube, which is okay. It's, uh, uh, this number cannot be too high, Otherwise, we would run into problems with other bounds that exist from ice cube. And before I finish, let me just say that uh, uh, there is a second neutrino tidal disruption event association, which is this one in red, which we are, co we are currently working on. Um, so I have a few slides of discussion um, just to wrap up. Um, first of all, I emphasize the detectability a lot. And right now, neutrinos and gravitational wave observatories are providing frequent high quality alerts to the astronomy community. So they have come a long way. And in my opinion, to start having neutrino and gravitational waves uh, detected jointly, we need two things. We need subhorse gravitational wave detectors um, and megaton scale neutrino detectors. Uh, and with those, we can ex explore a variety of objects like those I mentioned here. And you may wonder, what can we learn in terms of physics? So uh, for, for a core collapse supernova, if we have a galactic supernova, we can look for time structures that would correlate between gravitational waves and neutrinos, and they would probe these SASI dynamics that I mentioned earlier. And I'm, I'm, I'm especially excited about the idea of having, in addition to a single burst and to the total diffuse flux of neutrinos, I'm excited the idea of having a subset of local supernova neutrinos, maybe 10 or, or 100 of them that we can do statistics with and do population studies. Binary mergers are a challenge, but I emphasized earlier that even if we detect one neutrino, we can learn something. We can learn that that merger had at least one neutron star in it. Um, and the time of arrival tells, helps to exclude the most optimistic models. Uh, for disruption events, uh, detecting gravitational waves and neutrino from a, gravita from a tidal disruption event will confirm that this is a tidal disruption event and not something else because many of them are ambiguous, they can be uh, misidentified as AGN activity. So if we have a robust identification, we can test the rate of TDEs, the, uh, a neutrino can test the jet hypothesis. And in general, I didn't say much about this, but in general, tidal disruption events observation scale with the black hole mass. So it, the first thing to look for, to extract from, uh, from a measurement, uh, would be the black hole mass. And a neutrino measure, estimate of the black hole mass would be important because for active black holes and tidal disruption events as well, astronomical estimates of the black hole mass tend to underestimate the mass. So this would, it would be important in this context. So this is my final slide. I want to just want to say that there is something to look forward to. There is a lot to look forward to in the next decades. So I, I dream of having a figure like this with neutrino sensitivities plotted on top. Here is my first attempt. But of course, uh, I, I'm hoping that maybe in 10, 20 years, there will be even more studies of the interplay of neutrinos and gravitational waves. Uh, so I will stop here. I thank you for your attention. I hope there is time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, for a nice presentation. Now we will have some time for questions. So those who have questions, please uh, show that by raising your hand in the reactions. And we will start with that. I don't see any hands yet. So let me start with uh, one simple question. In fact, um, it is related to your introduction, but it's very good at this point on with this slide as well, because 
I was a little bit confused by that bracket, which shows binary supermassive black holes in galactic nuclei. And here, maybe I don't see the numbers quite well, but my understanding is that supermassive black holes would be those with the like billion times the solar mass. Right. And in that case, it seemed to me that the corresponding time scales uh, respectively scale uh, compared to one hertz, like 10 to negative nine hertz. Mm -hmm. uh, is that realistic at all to get such uh, low frequencies? I think those low frequencies uh, uh, in principle are realistic. So let me see if I can zoom in. Yeah, you see here 10 to the minus 10 or something like that. Um, I don't know much about this. Uh, this is something for the pulsar timing arrays. Um, but one question that I am curious about and I, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I thought I would propose the question at least, is if you have a phenomenon that has such a small, a small frequency, it means it lasts for a long time. It means we are talking about something that lasts for hundreds of years. So how do you capture such a signal in your lifetime? So there must be a way to tell if you are observing a black hole, this sort of supermassive black hole binary merger, but because this, this lasts for a long time, how do you do that in practice? Um, I, I don't know if maybe someone in the audience has an answer, but yes, we, have we, we can have such low frequency corresponding to these very long time scales. Okay. Okay, uh, questions from others? I did have another question of my own. Um, before people warm up to questioning, let me ask this thing. Uh, do I understand that the time delay, so if you're considering uh, the objects where something interesting like this is happening, let's say a merger, mm -hmm. um, 10 megaparsec away or something on that order of magnitude, mm -hmm. uh, do I understand it right that the time delay between the uh, supernova, uh, sorry, neutrino signal uh, is delayed corresponding to gravitational wave by years? Is that the correct? Um, why why you, did you have this score which was showing like tens of years? So is that the reason? Oh, tens of years. Um, I'm not sure which curve. Are you referring uh, if you to flip a few slides, uh, there was one of them on the summary. This, this one, one? Uh, 50, yes, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm trying to, uh, to sort of put the, uh, the understanding to the actual scales of years. Yeah, right. So this, is, this represents something else. So this represents, so first of all, uh, the answer is that no, we should expect a good co time coincidence between the neutrinos and the, and the corresponding gravitational wave. So when we have the, a merger detected, immediately in the first second or couple of seconds, we should look at neutrino data. We should look at neutrino data in those, in the first couple of seconds after the, the merger was detected because neutrinos shouldn't be delayed by much um, with respect to the merger. What's plotted here is the time you have to run your detector before you actually detect one of such merger neutrinos. And this is purely because it's very difficult. The, the, for each merger, is, is the probability of detecting one neutrino is very low. So you may have to wait until you get lucky and you get one. Um, and that could easily be decades. So, uh, but wasn't this uh, related on some uh, specific direction? So, if you have some event, you point your detector in a specific direction and then get the, this. So, this was then misunderstood. This is not that kind of uh, curve. Uh, no, this is for mergers. Neutrinos are emitted uh, in all directions, so we don't have to. We don't have to hope to have a specific orientation because the accretion disk is basically thermally emitting. So you. You should see neutrinos regardless of the orientation. So this, this curve refers to the it's a statistical, it's a statistical curve. It's the probability distribution of the arrival time of neutrinos. Mm -hmm. 
It's like, uh, it, it reminds me of, uh, uh, it's, it's Poisson statistics. It reminds me of uh, uh, these things that you study in university, like, okay, how, how, long, uh, how long do you have to wait until the first car passes by your window or something? And there is a statistics for that. Okay, okay, I, I see. Okay, I slightly misunderstood the meaning of that then. Um, okay, the next question, Henry Lejong. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, Hi. Great talk, thank you. Um, you got me excited about neutrinos now. <laughs> uh, especially the future, but a question on your, on a TDE event, uh, maybe I missed it and you, you could have covered it, but the interface between the jets and the outflow, wouldn't that cause a tremendous amount of uh, chaotic like turbulence? And wouldn't that be an extremely uh, uh, good generator of, of uh, you know, uh, neutrinos? Um... Yeah, right there. Well, is uh, okay. So I think uh, you are talking about what's the interface between the jet and the outflow. Right. Uh, so in some yes, in some sense, that's that's our idea as well. So we thought, okay, the outflow can basically serve as some sort of mirror, mirroring the photons into the jet. Uh, but but you're right. Uh, I'm actually doing this with a student. Um, we are trying to learn the structure of the jet and how the jet is affected by the outflow. And there are a couple of things that can happen that can affect the neutrino production. One of them is jet collimation. The outflow could simply exert pressure on the jet and, uh, and collimate it so that the, the jet is kind of squeezed. And I, I think intuitively that should boost the neutrino production because the, the environment inside the jet becomes denser. And the second thing is that um, this may be a little more speculative, but if the outflow is so um, extended that the jet has to go through it, uh, then the jet head will um, kind of hit the outflow and uh, some of the jet material will, will kind of circulate down. And so there will be this sort of layer between the... Yeah the jet and the outflow where there is this sort of turbulence, as you said. And um, as far as I know, this is something to look into, but I don't think there is much done on that. So something interesting to look at. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? This actually, this last question kind of reminded me that when you were discussing this part, one of the things that I was wondering uh, as well is actually something simpler. You are looking at P gamma processes. Why not PP processes, which probably should be energetic enough to produce uh, a lot of pions by themselves? Why do we need specifically P gamma? Yeah, um, yes, I mean, of course you have both. Um, so it's all about the density. So it turns out, and this is as far as I can explain, it turns out that uh, uh, the, the, the photon density is higher than the proton density. So you have these protons that are, that are accelerated, but in order to have enough density of protons for proton-proton collision to be efficient, you need to have some sort of barrier ahead of the jet. You need to have maybe the outflow um, blocking the jet or a cloud. Uh, there are papers about this happening if there is a cloud in front or if, uh, uh, yeah, so you need to have some, or, or some part of the, uh, part of the um, accretion disk, if the accretion disk has a weird shape, the jet could, kind of pass through it and then you can have proton pro if, if efficient proton proton collision but in the jet itself the protons are too under dense for this to happen um yeah th this is as much as i can say qualitatively okay okay sounds good okay um any other questions any other questions I don't see anything at this moment. So let me use the opportunity to thank Pio again for a nice presentation. And with that, we'll stop the official part.